Thank you. I welcome uh, Dr. Anindita Bhadro on behalf of Vivekananda College. And I'm sure uh, from her CV and the introductory speech given by Malavika that all our uh, listeners, including the students and the faculty members would be enriched by her uh, uh, lecture. And again, I would be grateful to all 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 the departmental colleagues for arranging such such a such an effort and with those few words i thank you from uh, on behalf of my college thank you thank you malavika on okay, malavika. thank you arvinda thank you thank you now Please. i would request our first semester student anushree chatterjee to briefly introduce our speaker today anushree yes, yes. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am, for giving me the privilege. Uh, Dr. Anindita Bhadra is a behavioral biologist at the Department of Biological Science, Aizar Kolkata. She founded the Dog Lab at Aizar Kolkata, which is engaged in studying the behavior, ecology, and cognitive abilities of dogs using the free ranging or the stray dogs in India as a model system. She is particularly interested in understanding the evolution of the dog human relationship. Much of her work on free ranging dogs has been highlighted by both the scientific and public media. Dr. Anindita Bhadro is the recipient of INSA Young Scientist Award, ACRB Women Excellence Award, and IAPA Young Scientist Award. She was involved in the founding of the Indian National Young Academy of Science in 2014 and was the chairperson of INYAS during its first three years of existence. She has been a member of the Global Young Academy since 2016, where she is presently a co-chair. She is currently the Associate Dean of International Relations and Outreach at ISAR Kolkata. She is also a professional thespian and leads the Bangla Theatre Group Mukhosh with her husband. Thank you, Anusri Swanindita. I once more again request you to this platform. This is your alma mater. And uh, it's my privilege to again have you here. So I'll stop sharing on Indita. I'm stopping this sharing. Thank you, Malubika. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, very much. Thank you. Uh, and I always feel humbled at such uh, detailed introductions. Thank you, Onusri. And uh, everyone at uh, Vivekananda College Thakur Bukur for this invitation. I'm happy to see some familiar names here on the screen. It's a great pleasure to be here. So uh, without much ado, I will start uh, sharing my screen. Um, just let me know whether you can see it. Uh, Onindita, this is on record. Uh, would it be a problem if this recorded is done? It's up to you. If no, you no, please go ahead. No problem. Okay. No problem. Go ahead. Okay. Um, my screen is visible, right? Your screen is visible and you're very much audible. Yes, perfect. Thank you. Okay. So, um, as you can see, the title of my talk is The Great Indian Joint Families of Free Ranging Dogs. And of course, this is a special privilege because I am delivering this talk so virtually at uh, Vivekananda College Thakur Pukur. So I could not help uh, but put down a couple of slides which are not really connected to the work which I will be presenting, but a bit of nostalgia and a bit of looking back because of the occasion. So I will begin by uh, telling you very briefly in two minutes about uh, how I came to be where I am. So I, uh, after school, I began my journey at the very college that you are today which is uh, uh, Vivekananda College, which we used to call the VCTP. And uh, this uh, college gate taught me all, all that I know about zoology. And I was lucky to have uh, a fantastic set of teachers who inspired me and who, who kind of got me introduced into the fantastic world of uh, life around us. 
from here i went on to do a masters uh, sorry uh, to do a masters at uh, baligan science college and from there i moved on to isc bangalore where i spent uh, you know lovely time not only doing my phd but also getting to learn a lot about what doing science meant uh, the philosophy of science uh, the principles of uh, doing research and engaging in, in a lot of activities and eventually from iisc after i graduated and continued as a postdoc for some time i came to uh, the old campus of iisr kolkata uh, which some of you might know of and then uh, here i started uh, uh, my research career as a, a faculty and uh, that, that's where the dog lab started way back in 2009 while uh, of course all of us need to do a lot of hard work and uh, persevere and you know do our bit in doing research uh, many uh, of us are often blessed to have um, excellent mentors during this uh, process and i have a few people to thank for my journey uh, some of whom on the slide you might actually know uh, professor aniruddh mukhopadhyay who is now at uh, calcutta university but used to be at bivekananda college who has mentored me actually much before i came to this college when i was in my plus 2 and i knew him through family and friends and then later during my bsc and msc days professor shilanjan bhattacharya who uh, inspired the love for ecology and behavior in us who kind of introduced us uh, the subject of ecology and behavior told us about the nuances of evolution took us on a field trip to uh, kumta and while on the field trip uh, on the way we visited iisc and that is where my entire dream of going to iisc to do a phd started so i have him to thank for me uh, dreaming to go to iisc and doing my phd in the first place professor uh, pulak lahiri at the uh, balikan science college a uh, lot of interesting discussions lot of interesting topics that he taught us and i always help him for being instrumental in ensuring that i got to attend my phd interview at ces because exam dates were clashing and he was the one who helped me uh, through the process of going through with uh, some special permissions and then of course uh, my lifetime mentor professor raghavendra gadakkar with whom i did my phd who keeps advising me even today anything i need to know anything i need help with i pick up the phone and call him or send him a whatsapp message and he's always there and the entire philosophy about science uh, that i developed has been through his inspiration this is the present campus of azer kolkata once this madness called the pandemic is over over and we are back to normalcy i invite all of you to visit us uh, we do lab visits uh, we organize lab visits for colleges you can come there look at uh, our facilities interact with our students get to know about the research that we do and enjoy our very beautiful campus uh, for a day while you are there of course we also invite people to apply for uh, summer internships and projects so you're most welcome to visit us whenever in the future so i got to azer kolkata moving from a phd in politics of social wasps this particular species is known as ropaliria marginata and of course as my favorite species of wasps and uh, after i had done my phd and postdoc on the species i moved to working on what are technically known as free ranging dogs or stray dogs now when i made this move uh, the points that were common between these two model systems that uh, i have worked on were that they were both social or group living animals uh, i was uh, interested in studying their behavior and of course i had learned how to ask questions but beyond that the stretch of unknown going from an insect system to a mammalian system was immense lot of people told me how on earth do you think you are going to survive how will you do this you don't know anything about mammalian systems you don't know anything about dogs you have in uh, in here you are probably an entomologist how do you even venture into this but uh, professor gadakar said why not and i said no. and i first when i tell people i work on dogs the standard is oh, navit breed 
or uh, you know how many pet dogs do you have and which breed of pet dogs do you have and when we talk about dogs to the world at large these are the pictures that come to our mind because typically it is assumed that dogs are supposed to be pets a lot of people who are dog lovers who empathize with them often say oh poor dog it's running on the street without realizing that the street is the natural home of the dog your home is not its real habitat when we think about dogs we feed and giving birth to them decide who may whom and we breed them we maintain your bread lines we hand rear them we give them beds to sleep on we give them vaccines but real dogs who actually survive in nature have for thousands of years are the ones the ones that get their offspring by themselves don't have humans interfering with their lives and these are the dogs that we study if you look at the history of dogs our current understanding says that wolves are wolf like creatures evolved into the dog that we know today why the standard notion again is that dogs are supposed to be pets and the breeds are the real dogs what we don't often realize is that the dog dog population of the world does not comprise of the pets of people's homes but of the free ranging dogs which typically occupy the global south of the world and they are also perhaps the condition in which dogs existed for thousands of years close to humans depending on humans for food associating with them but not really being pampered by humans not really being taken in affect and this is what gives us a more condition in which dogs and humans coexisted and that is why the excellent modern system for understanding how dogs and humans coevolved in the natural habitat this is just a glimpse of countries in the world marked in red where free ranging dogs exist so we are not the only country in the world where there are dogs on streets majority of the developing countries or the what is known as the global south have dogs on streets some as uh, adopted dogs some as just like you know for free dogs like us so there are community dogs so free ranging dogs at different levels of coexistence with humans are there in a large part of the world we look at dogs in urban space spaces which is what we typically study not really rural dogs or not really dogs in very remote areas but dogs which are living in close proximity with humans in urban habitats uh, they are of course present in all kinds of habitats you go to the mountains you find dogs in villages you go to the seaside you find dogs there you go to a remote village you find dogs there dogs are there wherever humans are you are going to find dogs they are primarily scavengers or uh, not really hunters but they can hunt there are reports of dogs forming large packs and hunting down wild animals especially in forest fringes and there's a lot of work which is going on in looking at dogs who are uh, you know affecting conservation measures but the thing that we get is dogs reach the forest fringes by following people and people have behaved less than them Start them and leave them there, and then the dogs are stranded, growing in population, and then they're getting into hunting. They are dependent mostly on humans for food. Scavengers, they live in small to medium group sizes. They can so the very large groups typically don't exist in uh, urban areas. Groups when they become very large, they often split up. Spike mortality levels are very high. of course with humans they have a relationship there are people who feed them vaccinate them give them beds to sleep on uh, treat them when they are hurt and who put water on them take them away when they are trying to mate and even poison them um they are known by a large number of alternative names treaties indies feral dogs stray dogs all kinds of names go around technically they are free ranging dogs and that's the terminology we use all the time when we look at the dog human relationship especially in the context of india this uh, story comes to me all the time i'm sure most of you would understand what the story is 
This is, of course, the Pandavas and here is Draupadi who has already fallen and the dog following them up to the heavens. So if you look back to the story, this is just one stray dog which is following a set of humans. And this is something all of us uh, who are uh, you know, living around dogs must have experienced at some point of time or the other. Either a dog has followed us or we have seen a dog follow someone else. If, if you have traveled in the hills, in the southern dogs from villages will try to follow you for some distance. So this is something that has been there during the time of the Mahabharata. It's there even today. And so dogs have not really changed much when it comes to the ranging population in their interactions with humans. So they are a very good in model system. They're an interesting model system. They have a long and shared history with humans. And in the Indian subcontinent, we can actually study them in this native condition. So we can uh, use them, understand their behavior and their ecology and their evolution with humans. And from a practical perspective, if you need to reduce dog human conflict, you cannot just take arbitrary steps. You really need to understand their behavior and ecology. And here is something that I would like to highlight, which is something that I feel uh, very deeply about, is that here, living in India, we actually have, have an advantage over the global north. There are lots of apps in dog behavior, dog cognition, dog evolution, but they have to, they work with them. If they want to work with free-ranging dogs, they have to go find free-ranging dogs, spending a lot of money in travel to go to that here, we don't need to follow the West in the research. We need from the front. And this is exactly what has happened in the last few years that we have been publishing from India. That now, when people tell me, what have you accomplished in 10 years of your research? I tell them, what I've how many papers and how many grants. What I think is, you know, my uh, winning point is that established labs in Germany, in Austria, in Hungary, in uh, USA, who were always studying pet dogs are now sending their students to developing countries to find populations of free-ranging dogs because they realize the importance of studying this species as a model system rather than just studying pets in laboratories. So today we are celebrating Darwin Day and how can I talk about work without talking about Darwin? Uh, many of you might know Darwin had a special love for dogs, and of course, the here, here I'm talking about pet dogs. He always had a pet dog uh, around him uh, ever since he was a young boy. And here I would like to show you, uh, I, I don't know if you're aware, all of Darwin's uh, correspondence is available uh, on, freely on the internet. There's a Darwin project which keeps all of this. And here I highlight a line. The letter he's writing to someone, this person who the sir is, is not very clear. Uh, but this letter, he says, I most heartily subscribe to what you say about the qualities of dogs. I have one whom I love with all my heart. And uh, historians say that this is about a dog called Polly, uh, uh, who Darwin had uh, taken in after the Polly belonged to his uh, daughter, one of his daughters. And when the daughter got married, Darwin kept the dog. So uh, this just shows how uh, close he felt to dogs. And if you have not read this, if you have never seen this book, this is highly recommended. This particular uh, sketch from the book, The Expression of Emotions in Man and Animals, published in 1872. This is Darwin's third major book. Uh, the first being, of course, the original of the sec uh, his book on sexual selection, uh, The Descent of Man. And this is the third book. And in this, he, the book has uh, beautiful um, sketches and actually has some photographs for the first time, uh, where he uh, you know, talks about human expressions and expressions of uh, animals and the detailed postures of dogs. And he explains each posture, what it means. And these are all interactions between a dog and a human, typically the master. So Darwin uh, actually, Used dogs to dog parallels humans, and he was very convinced that dogs can tell us a lot about human beings. When we talk about studying animal behavior, uh, 
I don't know if you people have read about nicotine burden. If you have, then you would identify the matrix on my uh, screen where I talk about mechanism, ontogeny, adaptive value, and progeny of a behavior. Uh, where uh, the mechanism is how the behavior occurs in the individual, ontogeny is how it develops uh, during the development process, adaptive value is why this behavior is adaptive for the species, and phylogeny is how this behavior arose in the species in the space. And these four questions were laid out for, as a framework for studying animal behavior by Nicotin Bergen. So these are famously known as Tin Bergen's four questions. These questions can be divided into two categories of questions. Specifically, people like us who study animal behavior try to break down our questions into approximate questions, which typically address questions of mechanism and ontogeny, asking how an animal lives or how a species of animal lives, and ultimate questions referring to the adaptive value and phylogeny, asking why does this animal live the way it does? And Onita. whatever question yes. Onita. Uh, just interfering, I think so. Students are having some problem. They are saying that they cannot uh, hear you. There's some disconnecting occurring. What is happening? Sorry, I didn't hear you. Uh, they are saying that the, your words are not coming very clearly. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, maybe I'll just check my connection once. It's 4G. It's fine. Um, can you, uh, share me? I'll just keep the video off in that case. Yeah. yeah. Maybe that'll help. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Hope you start, let's see. Okay. okay. Okay, uh, is it better now? I think so. Uh, yeah, okay. yeah, it's, it's clear, it's clear, it's much clearer. Yeah, yeah, I'll just keep the video off in that case. Okay, so I was talking about Tinvergence for questions, and uh, I said that uh, the mechanistic and ontogenic questions are typically called proximate questions, and questions about adaptive value and phylogeny are called ultimate questions. And people who study animal behavior typically have these two kinds of questions about any system that they're studying, how an animal lives, and why it lives the way it does. So uh, I will uh, tell you about some of the questions that we address and then uh, highlight a couple of studies that we have done in the class, uh, in, in the lab for today's talk. So in the dog lab, we look at broad questions like how dogs interact with each other, which could be in the framework of mating, parental care, sudden settlement interactions, territorial interactions, competition over food space and mates. We look at how dogs interact with humans uh, in looking at humans as resources, humans as threats. We try to understand how smart dogs are in their ability to solve tasks and ability to distinguish quantities. Recently, we have also started looking at patterns in behavior, and this is an ongoing study. In doing all of this, Malubika, there's some noise in the background. Yeah, I think so. Let's let you So in all of this, we are trying to answer, uh, address the big picture of how dogs became man's best friend or how dogs and humans co-evolved. At the bottom of the slide is uh, the link to the Dog Lab website. Anyone who's interested in exploring in detail all the kinds of things that we do, please visit us at the website. Here, I'm going to highlight work related to how we uh, have studied the development of a pup and how we have tried to understand the early life of a dog, which is a pup. Two people who have uh, helped me in the founding years of the dog lab are, are Manubi and Srijuni. And the work that I'm going to talk to you about is mostly from Manubi's thesis. And I chose to speak on this particular piece of work for a reason, 
Manubi is also an ex-student of Vivekananda College Thakur Bukur. So I thought that when I'm talking to students at Zoology Vivekananda College, this is the work that I should be highlighting because it's work done by Manubi in uh, the lab uh, that I run. Both of us alumni of VCTP. So what are the different aspects of the pup's life that we have studied? Of course, their natural history, you know, how large are the litters? What is the sex ratio at birth? Uh, 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 what kind of uh, you know denning behavior does the mother show? What are the characteristics of dens? Maternal care, I'll, and I'll elaborate on that. Early life interactions of a puppy, play behavior in particular, and mortality or survivorship of the pups. When you look at a pup's life, a pup has a very complex life. It is interacting with not just the mother or the siblings, but it's interacting with other adults in the group. It is interacting with other puppies and juveniles in the group. It is interacting with humans who can give them food, who can show them a lot of love, or in this particular case, who can poison them and kill all of them altogether. So a pup, as it's growing older and older, is going through a lot of experiences. And in Manubi's thesis, we try to address some of these. So as I said, if you look at a pup's interaction, all the blue circles here marked with P's, uh, the light blue circles are puppies of a litter that we are focusing on. Uh, the dark blue circle is our non-sibling pups. Uh, there's a red, and uh, which is the mother, a pink, which is an aloe mother, and I'll soon come to this. Brown, which is a putative father, I'll also talk about this. And of course, a yellow circle here showing humans with whom the pups interact. This is just a glimpse to show you how interactive the life of a pup, pup is and this is only considering one behavior, which is play. Now take into consideration all the other behaviors that the pup would undergo, then imagine what complex uh, networks these would give us if we are going to look at the entire set of interactions in a pup's life. So we begin with parental care. Just to be clear that we understand parental care uh, at the same level, here, any behavior shown by a parent towards an offspring, which will increase the survival value or the chances of survival of the offspring can be considered as care. We typically look at care under two broad headings, active care or passive care. Active care would include high energy behaviors like nursing, aloe grooming, pile sleeping, play, regurgitation, et cetera. Passive care is more like care, which is there, but which does not involve a lot of energy expenditure, like uh, sitting next to the pups and guarding them, resting with them together at the same place, or taking them along when they are going to forage. So there will be food sharing, but there is no active engagement as such. Uh, of course, the active behaviors are energy consuming, which means they are costly. And here, in biological terms, whenever we say costly, we basically mean that in showing this behavior, the mother is bearing some cost to herself, which would translate into her ability to give birth to future offspring. And that is why there has to be some balance between the amount of um, expenditure into one litter and the next litter so that the mother can eventually have maximum time reproductive success. This is what evolutionary theory tells us. So we looked at maternal care, I went into categories, pre-birth maternal care when she is going to be a mother and hasn't given birth, and post-birth is the kind of care that she is giving. So pre-birth maternal care is basically in terms of finding suitable birthing places or dens for her pups. Um, so we actually studied Denny behavior. And as you can see from the numbers here, the sample size was quite large. There were 148 den sites, and this occurred was not in season. Puppies were seasonal, so this was spread out over a span of five years uh, during the early stages of uh, the dog lab. And whenever we studied dens, uh, we recorded various characteristics like the size of the den, the darkness or the light inside the den, available resources near the den, the size of the litter born in the den, and we noted down all the details of birth of this litter. 
in doing so, we obtained a lot of data. Um, dense were of all kinds, could be simply a hole in the ground or a dustbin or somebody's discarded sofa set like this, or actually someplace that mother has found, which is a nice shelter and gone and given birth. And as you can see, often human around would help and keep the puppies warm. When we analyzed the data that we obtained, um, we found that the mothers had a preference for medium to large den sizes, very small dens were not preferred, irrespective of what the litter size was. Here in this three plot, we have den scores based on these various characteristics that we measure, which increases from the side to the side. We have number of den in each uh, score, which is the count here, and uh, we have the litter size increasing in this axis. And you see here that here, low dense score and low litter size and low count uh, also has low count, whereas here, the counts are increasing. When we looked at uh, the score of the distance between resource and den, we found that uh, the mothers who had uh, small litters were a little stringent in their choice than mothers with larger litters because obviously they had higher energy demands and uh, the distance from the den uh, uh, from food, uh, distance of the den for food and water had a very important role to play in deciding whether this was a good sign. So of course, if you have a lot of babies to take care of, you wouldn't uh, like to spend a lot of time running to the supermarket. It's good to be close to where the resources are. And in this case, of course, resources meant human given food, human uh, uh, generated garbage, which means that they were not denning far away from the human's world. It was very surprising because in all other animals, even those which are close to humans, they try to be away from humans when they give birth. They try to hide their dens from humans, but this was a species which went to humans to give birth, often went inside their homes to give birth. So they were not fearful of humans while giving birth and left in dens. So we asked, is it a random choice? Do the mothers just give birth wherever they find a, a, a hole or, or a shelter, or are they actually putting some effort? Because we did first, are they actually incurring some cost in searching for dens and choosing? And for this, we conducted another study uh, on a separate set of 20 pregnant females. First, you identify females with your and then you have them for a period of one month. So we actually started with a larger pool, but then they gave birth to so finally we had on 20 and we found that no mothers are not really just giving birth in the first site they find. They choose dens, rest in those, dig up a little bit, spend some time, discard it, go on another one. And then there can be two to six intermediate dens. And what we found is from the first den to the last den, there is a steady increase in the dense core. So obviously, the mothers were discarding not so nice dens for a better one and eventually giving birth to an option. So they were actually spending energy in searching for these dens. So this was costly. We call it parental care. So if I sum this up, then we found distance from resources to a big influential factor, but anthropogenic dis disturbance was not important. Uh, dens were found where human activity was quite high. Begging for hum from humans for food was also an additional factor which they used uh, for scavenging. And den selection was an active choice of the mother, and that is why this could be characterized as parental care. This was published report, so anyone who's interested is freely available. You can go check it out. Any questions up to you? Uh, Anindita, I have a question. So is this is completely mother's yes. choice? Yes, completely. No one else is involved in the process. So if you look at the parent cost, then the father is not paying any cost in this particular aspect. It's totally the mother's cost, right? No. The father, <laughs> we don't even know who the father is. These are mating species. So uh, they meet multiply, so the identity of the father is very. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have a question? No, I don't think so. They have a question right now. Okay, I'll go on. If you have a question at any point, please stop and ask, okay? Yeah, they will raise hand or they Otherwise, can put the question on the chat box. To my computer. Okay, okay. Yeah. So now we look at maternal care after they have given birth, which is, of course, the most energy intensive care that the mother has to give. Uh, here, Manubi studied 22 mother litter units, uh, which were uh, under 15 groups. So some groups had multiple mothers giving birth in the, in the same season. And this was, again, uh, work done for five years in the uh, pup rearing season. And in the first two weeks, the mothers are typically hiding their pups inside the den and curling up with them most of the time. They're not very accessible. And the mothers don't like uh, people going very close. So we started observations from the third week when the mother starts leaving them for, for longer periods and the pups also start crawling out of their den. And uh, she continued observing until uh, the 17th week of uh, the pup's age, provided that the pups survived that long. And uh, as you can see here, there were 1,452 hours of observations involved through uh, processes that we called instantaneous scans and all occurrences sessions. Again, uh, there is a 3D dot here, and uh, let me just explain this in a little more detail. So here you see that uh, litter size increases uh, from right to left, and age of the pups increase from uh, top to bottom. And on the z-axis, we have the proportion of active care shown by the mother. At what is active care that I have been explained? All kinds of energy intense uh, care was active care. And uh, as you can see that the distribution is not uniform. I'd like to draw your attention to this part of the graph where the litter size is small, uh, age is uh, young. There you see the highest proportion of active care and then there is a gradient from uh, the lesser uh, uh, age older and then from where small litter size to uh, large litter size. So, uh, after, of course, you don't just look at patterns, you do a lot of complicated statistics, and I'm not going into the details of uh, all the statistics, but to give you the results, uh, the total proportion of time that the mother spent uh, in parental care was dependent on the age of the pup, as well as on the exercise, so there was a three-way interaction which was involved here, and of course, as I showed here, mothers with the smallest litter showed the highest level of care, and the pups were really young. Now, this is, uh, I, I'm showing you the data, the overall data. Now, what is the level of care? This is an important question. So here, the same graph now has actually uh, been replotted for the proportion of active care that each pup receives. So if you have a litter of five, you divide the active care by five. If you have a litter of one, you divide the active care by one. And as you see here, as expected, litter size being the lowest and the age being the lowest, you get the highest level of care, which means that for a puppy, having fewer uh, siblings is helpful because then it can get maximum care, which basically means that the mothers are not able to scale up their care levels as the litters become larger and larger. There is, of course, an optimum level of care that, or, or a maximum level of care that a mother can possibly give so if a mother has a very large litter, the care per pup will obviously reduce. So there has some optimum where the mother also gains and the pup also gains. And we found, I'm not showing you the data, but we have found that the op, uh, mean litter size in the population is four. So four or five would be the, four and five are the modal values. So this is probably an optimum litter size, which is sustainable in the population. So found that the mothers were regulating their level of active care according to the number of pups that they had to nurture. So for siblings, there was obviously some semblance of sibling rivalry which could be seen. This paper is published in Royal Society Open Science, as you can see. Again, it's uh, open access. Anybody can access it. We also divided the level of care that was shown into active care and passive care. Active care marked here in red dots, passive care marked in green dots. And as you would expect, as the pups grow older, 
level of active care, which is energy intensive and more costly, decreases significantly, and litter size has no effect on passive care. We also looked at the different kinds of behaviors which comprise care. Like you can see, it can be suckling, of course, which is very, very important in the early ages of the pup. It could be allogrooming, piling up and sleeping with the pups, playing, so on and so forth. And as you can see here, just from the colors, that the mother's expenditure of energy and time in each of these behaviors is not stable over the pup ages. As the pups grow older, she adjusts her investment in these different behaviors. So she is actively managing her involvement and invest, uh, investment in the puppies as they are growing older and older. Initially, she is spending much more time in nursing them and in uh, piling up and sleeping and keeping them warm. As they grow older, her behavioral investment changes more to protective behavior and play and uh, less and less in suckling. Now, of course, suckling or nursing is the most important behavior in maternal care for mammals. When we are looking at it from the perspective of the pup, we call it suckle. When we look at it from the perspective of the mother, we call it nurse. So we eventually looked at this particular behavior in a little more detail. And we found that nursing does not continue forever, as we all know, that as the pups grow older, at one point of time, the mother will stop feeding them with milk and they'll change to solid food, as is expecting in all mammalian species. So we found that when the pups are three weeks old, the mother is investing as high as almost 20% of her time in nursing them. And this investment is sharply reducing as they're growing older and older, completely stopping by their 13 or 14 week of age. Now, we looked into this in a little more detail because there are a lot of interesting questions which you can address using this particular behavior in evolutionary terms. So we looked at each nursing bout and we looked at how, what proportion of the nursing bouts happening in a week were initiated by mothers and what proportion were initiated by pups? So is the mother eager to nurse or all, is all the in initiative coming from only the pups? As you can see in the first, uh, no, the second week and the third week, uh, all of this is spread out all over the place, which means the mother and the pups are equally interested in the pups suckling. Uh, so is the fifth week. From the sixth week, there is a drastic difference. Lower proportion of uh, nursing is initiated by the mother. Higher proportion is initiated by the pups. And as you reach here to eight, ninth, tenth weeks, you see 100% is pup initiated. Mothers are no longer initiating nursing bouts. So mothers, uh, uh, you know, uh, interest in nursing has stopped. All the bouts that we see here happen because the pups are still interested in suckling from her. So mother initiated pup uh, uh, nursing goes down, pup initiated nursing goes up. This period, when this happens, when the mother is no longer interested but nursing still continues because the pup is interested, is demarcated as the weaning window and there is a fantastic opportunity that this provided us to study a very, very well-known theory in evolution, which is known as parent-offspring conflict theory. If you have read about this, then you don't need to go into the detail, but I've, just for the convenience of everyone, I will very briefly explain what this means. This theory was proposed by Robert Travers in 1974 to explain weaning conflict in humans and was very, very controversial, but He's, his idea was based on genetic relatedness, and it's a very simple idea. What he said is, uh, if, if, if I look at parental investment as plotted on the x-axis, and I look at benefit or cost to the parent or the offspring as plotted on the y-axis, then there is a benefit for the mother in giving care up to a point where without her care, her offspring will not survive. But after a point, the mother should stop giving care to the current offspring, replenish her energy so that she can invest in the next offspring. Because she's equally related to all her offspring, which is 0.5, her interest in making all her offspring survive should be equal. 
However, if you look at it from the perspective of the offspring, the offspring also wants a sibling because it's related to the sibling by half. So half cost, whereas it is related to itself by one. So there will be a time here demarcated by small p when the mother would think it has given enough care and the mother should want to stop care. There would be a time y when the offspring should think I have received enough care and now I want care to be given to a sibling. But between p and y will be this window of being conflict when the offspring would demand care and the mother would want to stop care. And this will happen because of the differential relatedness to the next yet to be born offspring. So this is the idea that Trivers had proposed. There have been many pieces of work, basically modeling based to test this out, but very few uh, experimental examples of parent offspring conflict theory exist. And even the ones that exist are from laboratory setup. Nobody has really tried it out in uh, a natural habitat in a natural system. But this gave us this thought that yes, we can look into weaning conflict. Let us look at this behavior of nursing suckling a little more in detail. If you look at the duration of each bout of nursing, then the red ones are mother initiated nursing bouts, blue ones are pup initiated nursing bouts, and in the initial few weeks, they are quite equal. But as the pups grow older, you have only pup initiated bouts and zero mother initiated bouts in duration, which again corroborates this earlier result. And this happens over the same weaning window as expected. So the weaning conflict is quite real. And we were the first to identify eight to 13 weeks of pup age as the weaning window, which has never been done in dogs before. Now, this is very important even for people who are working with pet dogs, rearing dogs and breeding them because eight to 13 weeks marks, marks the weaning, which basically means before that, the pups are not capable of being completely independent of the mothers and they need to be nursed by the mothers. So early adoption of puppies at four weeks, five weeks is not a good idea. So this is some practical output of this piece of work, which was published in class one. Again, an open access journal, anybody can see it. And from all of this work, Manubi came up with the timeline of maternal care, which I think is excellent because for the first time, we could demarcate the developmental period of a pup into periods when the mother was giving high levels of care, when there was end of conflict, and then there was post uh, 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 POC, uh, mostly passive maternal care in the onward when there is uh, no care at all. And then majority, this is the time when we called uh, them juveniles and until 13 weeks, we called puppies. So this, this helped us to say, when does the juvenile period begin and when does the pup period end? This is almost like you know, milestones that you see in pediatrician's clinic for human babies. Now we have a milestone chart for development of uh, dog pups. And later, other pieces of work actually showed that many behaviors actually match with these windows of their development, which is also very nice. When we now sum up what we got from this piece, these several pieces of uh, analysis is that Mothers are really showing a lot of care. They're investing a large proportion of their time in caring for their pups, and they're cleverly adjusting the levels of active and passive care. Uh, the pups are competing with siblings for uh, receiving active maternal care, and we have identified the weaning window uh, of the dogs to be seven to 13 weeks. Interestingly, as I told you, that there were 15 groups of dogs for 22 weeks, which meant there were multiple mothers in some of these groups. And this is what was very interesting. Manubi not only found maternal care, but we also recorded alloparental care in these groups. So in this diagram, this uh, outer circle with five in it denotes groups where we, she saw only maternal care. The inner brown shows groups in which she found maternal care and female allo care. The gray shows maternal care and male allocare, 
And this intersection of 10 shows groups which received all three kinds of care, which is maternal care, female allo care, and male allo care. This one outlier outside is because there was one grandmother who adopted her grand pups and had a miscarriage herself and behaved like a mother. So we could not put her either in the uh, light uh, beige circle or the brown circle, so we put her outside. So there were 19 mother litter units from 15 groups where we found allocate. And so of course we had to look into this behavior in a little more detail. What we found was very interesting. There were female relatives. They could be grandmothers, or they could be older siblings or aunts who provided care in some form of the or the other to the pups. And of course, you understand this is a relative can be obvious benefits through kin selection to the females if they are helping each other out. When we looked at the behavior in a little more detail, we are looking at proportion of time spent in active care again. The open circles are for mothers, the red circles are for mothers. And as you can see, this is what we had already seen from mothers. If you now put the behavior of the allo mothers, of course, it is not as high as the mothers at any period of time. There is a gradual increase and then a decrease as the pups grow older, unlike high rates and then lowering. So we found that even in the third week of age, there can be allo care, and female allo care was much lower than the uh, maternal care that the pups were receiving. When we looked at male allo care, we call these males putative fathers because they were behaving like fathers. But as I told in response to Malovika's question, we don't know the identity of the fathers because all of these dogs mate multiply, they are promiscuous breeders. We only knew that these males had mated with these females. But then whether they were the fathers of these pups, this question we could not answer because we could not have, do the genetics. I'm actually still looking for someone who's ready to do this with me because I'm very keen on doing the genetics to identify what the relationship between the putative father and the mother is. Often the putative father was also a sibling of the mother or of the father of the mother, but then it could have been also the father of the pup. So the, Genetics is very, very complicated. But what was interesting is the black line here is for mother, blue is for putative father, and red is for allo mother. Putative fathers and mothers statistically showed equal levels of care and much higher care than the allo mothers. When we looked at this behavior, I will first show you evidence that this happens. Wait, I'm out of it. Oops. So this was guarding behavior because the male is just sitting around the pups and the mother is nowhere to be seen. Here the pups are soliciting the male for food. He regurgitates. And this behavior is often seen in the mothers when the pups are five, six weeks old. This is, of course, play. When we looked at the behavior the putative fathers show, uh, you would see here that this is uh, the same graph that I showed you for mother. And the colors here have changed to match with the colors that Manubi has used in this other graph. And uh, this is the graph for the putative fathers. Of course, they cannot show any nursing. So nursing is zero. But what you see here mostly is the pink, which is protecting behavior you see gray, which is piling up, and you see a lot of black, which is play. And so if you see the various distribution of behavior, the mother and the putative father, there is a significant uh, difference between the distribution of patterns. And we concluded that while mothers are mostly busy feeding, the fathers are mostly busy playing and also protecting the dogs. So there is 
very clear cut division of labor, if you might call it, between the putative fathers and the mothers, though they are showing almost equal levels of care. So concluding, there are female relatives which are providing care, uh, uh, but at a low, low level than the mothers. There are putative fathers providing care at comparable to the, uh, level to the mothers and the nature of care between mothers and putative fathers. So if you look at the life of a pup, there are caring mothers, there are helping aunts or sisters or grandmothers or all of these, and there are attentive putative fathers. So all of these together are supposed to increase the chances of survival of the puppy. I'm not showing you data here, but just let me tell you that Manubi's and Srijuni's work showed that in the early life of the pup, until seven months when they reach maturity, sexual maturity, which is early, the mortality level is as high as 81%. Only 19% of the pups born in a year survive. So if there are five pups in a litter, the chances are only one will live and become sexually mature and give birth in the next season. And unfortunately, 63% of this mortality is contributed by humans. So we are actually the largest predators of dogs. Now, remember the weaning window, and I mentioned to Trevor's parent offspring conflict theory. So we actually carried out a test. So the story behind this is very interesting. One day, uh, Sri Juni came back and told me that, you know, that there's something hap uh, funny happening because uh, the mother was sharing food with the pups and now she is chasing them away. So I said, okay, fine, uh, go on and uh, keep checking. And then Manubi came and said the same. And then we said, okay, fine, why don't we do an experiment? Because that is what behavioral biologists are good at designing. So we designed an, a simple experiment. But before that, let me show you some evidence of the weaning conflict. I'm sure many of you would have experienced this around you. Often people think the mothers are being very nasty because they are not allowing the puppies to feed. People force the mothers, hold them down so that the pups can feed. But this is a very, very natural behavior and this is required for their survival. So this is the thing that we see very often. And this is the weaning window that I have already mentioned. And this is the theory that we want to test. The, I'm not going into the detail of this. So we wanted to test if parent offspring conflict exists in dogs. We asked two questions. Do mothers and pups show conflict over extended parental care? In this case, this is sharing of food given by humans because we realized that when there are puppies around, people become a little more lenient, a little more caring. They give more food to the dogs and the mother has a very small window of opportunity to eat all this food by herself and replenish her reserves or to share this food with her pups and be uh, an altruistic mother. And we asked that whether resource quality that is being made available affect the level of cooperation and conflict in the mothers. So here is the experiment and behaviors that Manubi showed. Uh, so basically the experiment is very simple. Depending on how many puppies there are in the litter, for example, this has four pups and one mother. So there are five individuals. Five times you throw a biscuit at them where everybody can reach. And then you check whether the mother is allowing them to eat the food or showing conflict or sharing the food. So this behavior is allow when the mother is allowing her uh, to eat, uh, allowing her pups to eat. And this is where she's actually showing high level of uh, aggression. This is not the mother, the other one is. So the mother is quite ready to fight with her pup in order to get the food. She's not to get to the food at all. So this is what we did. We gave them biscuits and we checked and we saw that we, the experiment was started at the eight week of pup age, which is when, as you would remember, the weaning conflict has started. And we saw very clearly that as the pups grew older, conflict increased. 
Uh, and uh, so, of course, conflict exists. And we looked at the body condition of the mother. We used a score from the first to say whether the mother is looking less healthy, more healthy. And uh, we saw the blue bars are the mothers on, uh, on the first week of the experiment. Gray bar is the last week of the experiment and orange bar is intermediate. And there was a significant change uh, in the mother's body condition over this small window of time from eight to 13th week, which basically said that the mothers were not only competing with their pups, but also they were gaining in their body condition, which means that their conflict is paying back. So they were not being altruistic mothers at all. Then we look at the physicist model what the two situations would look like. If, so line one is this line, which we already have from the biscuit data. And then we said, suppose now we give them meat, which is a much richer resource, which is protein, which is very important for the growth of the pups. But again, it can be a very rich resource for the mother to gain back her reserves. So there could be two conditions where the mother is altruistic and the mother is uh, uh, selfish. So if she's selfish, then she will have higher levels of conflict than she did for biscuits. If she is altruistic, she will gradually increase her conflict, but she will begin at a lower level of conflict than what she did for biscuits and shared with us. And then we went ahead and this, did the experiment with the biscuits. And this is what we, uh, sorry, this is what we got. So here, I Uh, on India, I think so you're not uh, uh, audible now. Not audible. Yeah, right now you're audible. For, for a few seconds, we're not. You are. Yeah, not I was not speaking. Okay. I was just showing the video. So both allow and offer would be cooperative behaviors and so would be food sharing. Now comes conflict. And as you can see, the pup is quite interested in the food, but the mother is not interested in sharing at all. So here's the data. This on the right hand side, a panel is the theoretical prediction of what a selfish mom would look like. Look at line two and look at the data here. It, in fact, it was such a close match to the prediction that we thought there's something wrong and we made them do the analysis over and over again just to cross check. And we finally concluded that yes, the mothers are selfish indeed. They are not at all interested in sharing food with their pups when it's richer resources. They are just trying to maximize their lifetime reproductive success. And when we looked at the body condition of the mothers, there was a significant improvement over this time, period of time. So uh, we said that mothers are definitely competing with pups over, during the weaning phase. And this was the first experimental demonstration of parent offspring conflict in a natural system. And this got us a lot of uh, visibility. Uh, so to Mothers show weaning from the same period uh, during which, uh, as we had seen in the suckling, 
uh, conflict over extended parental care exists, and this is uh, resource dependent, increasing with pup age. Mothers tend to assure lifetime reproductive success, which is a very nice proof of the evolutionary theory of parent offspring conflict. Uh, this got us reviews everywhere from uh, science news uh, to the local media, and we were very happy about it. Finally, I'm going to talk about selfishness in pups. Not only the mothers are selfish, so are the pups. Uh, we actually looked at conflict between pups and allo mothers because Manubi came and told me for the first time that there's something very funny happening. The allo mothers are even nursing. And this was quite a surprise because we expect, you know, allo grooming, we expect protection, but nursing or allo suckling is a bit too much. And then I told her, why don't you go and check what is really happening? Look at each bout. And just like the earlier data, now we looked at mother initiated, pup initiated, and allo mother initiated nursing. And lo and behold, what we found is all the purple dots see lie on the zero line. Basically, which means that whenever we saw allo suckling or allo nursing, it was 100% initiated by the pups. So it was not like the allo mothers were such altruists that they were coming and nursing the uh, puppies of their sisters or their daughters. But basically, whenever the pups got a chance, they grabbed the allo mother and suckled from them. So the puppies, if you look at their behavior, they would try to suckle from every available uh, lactating female, whether it is the mother or not. And whenever the allo mothers realize that it is not their pups, they actually run away. So the duration of the uh, allo nursing bouts are actually much shorter than the durations of nursing bouts between the pups and their mothers. And this was very interesting because this meant that the pups are actually taking advantage of being in a larger group. So on the one hand, in, uh, uh, for them, there might be more resource sharing happening between the mothers if there's a large group and two females are giving birth in the same place. There can be conflict over resources, but at the same time, there can be more protection and more advantage to the pups. So again, it's a very, very complex and dynamic system. And this is the data about the, uh, the termination, where we see that all the termination happens uh, by, through refusal of the allo mothers. So allo mothers were not really volunteer, volunteering nursing. They were victims of what is known as milk theft. Again, this was very interesting because milk theft has still now been reported only in herbivorous herd living animals, and it has never been reported in any uh, canid species so this was the first report of milk theft in a canid species. And as I had said, that if you look at the developmental timeline with other pieces of work that we have done, we have added many, many more factors to this timeline of development in terms of interactions with humans, in terms of milk theft and alloparental care, and in terms of play interactions with siblings. And uh, this just shows you at different points of time in the pup's early life, there are different behaviors which the pup is going to develop and some be, it will continue for life, some will end at a particular point of time. Some of the interesting findings from the lab, which I'm not going to have the time to go into details of, but which, which you can check out from our papers, are uh, of course that they have a very active complex social life, which is what I have been talking about till now found that sterilization does not really have an impact on behavior. It is not that sterilization makes them less aggressive or more aggressive, does not even change their intensity of trying to mate, only they cannot mate and have offspring. Uh, this work is uh, not yet published. Uh, we found that humans are the biggest threat to their survival and also a major source of food. Uh, dogs are very good at understanding various human gestures, and we have done a series of experiments and published several papers on this by now. Uh, they're very good at making decisions regarding humans based on both immediate as well as past experiences with humans. And uh, a very interesting piece of work that is my favorite is that we have shown that it is really love shown by a human and not the food provided by them, which helps in building trust between stray dogs and humans.
this is a glimpse of uh, the PhD students and uh, MS students of the lab. And then there have been always a lot of interns who have worked in the lab and who have contributed to a lot of work that has been done. So I would definitely like to thank all of them. But of course, the work that I have presented today, as I told you, is Manubis. And anyone who wants to find about, uh, out about this work but does not really want to read technical papers, I highly recommend this one article, which was published in Current Science uh, in Resonance, uh, end of last year. So this is a series of articles which Professor Raghavendra Gadakar has been writing for Resonance, and which is soon going to be published as a book by the Indian Academy of Science. Highly recommended for anybody in uh, anybody with interest in animal behavior. The title is How to Design Experiments in Animal Behavior. Each uh, issue focused on a, a particular uh, piece of work or a particular uh, uh, group of animals. And the last one uh, uh, is uh, uh, the, the last of the series where he's talked about mammals, basically talks of all the work that I have spoken to you uh, about today. And uh, so this is basically focusing on several of Manubi's papers. So I would highly recommend this article for a general reader. And I would like to uh, stop here, thanking Malubika for the invitation. Uh, and uh, of course, the funding agencies for supporting our work for so long, uh, Isar Kolkata and the Behavioral Ecology Lab, which is a, a where uh, we uh, the dog lab uh, exists with two other behavior and ecology uh, labs in the department. And of course, thanks to the dogs and thanks to all of you for your patient hearing. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh Thank you, Onindita. Thank you for this illuminating lecture. In fact, I was not aware of one fact you said that Darwin had a special affection for dogs. And I personally feel that many of our college students in our college, we have this uh, lot of families of free ranging dogs. And many of our college students do take care of these little pups. So they have got a very scientific in depth into the social life, the biology of the behavior. There's also choice of den, and you said there's a science of maternal care. There was a whole lot of science get going into maternal care. And I was also not aware of this concept of putative fathers. So this is something which I learned today. And there was this alloparental <laughs> concept you developed. So as a whole, we got a panoptic glance of the social behavior that we see in these free ranging dogs. So many of the students will then now be able to relate when they see such behaviors, they'll be able to relate with your talks. So I'd request the students to directly ask Madam if you have any questions. She is available. So if you want to question her, you can ask her regarding any behavior, any particular behavior. A lot of you have seen handle those pups in our college. Uh, Onilita, they I think so they don't have much of a question. But I have one question for you. That is, in uh, cases of families, yes, we see a territoriality, right? So when these pups have uh, reached yes. a certain age, specifically the males, uh, most cases we see a territorial mm -hmm. behavior. So um, uh, when we uh, get into a dog uh, society, you see that there are certain dogs controlling a particular place and there's another set of dogs controlling a particular place. This is very much visible when we, yes. uh, when a new new car, which has not been seen in that area, enters a particular space, certain dogs go on screaming behind that. So have you ever yes. looked into that? Yeah, so there were a couple of MS students who have done some experiments on this. MS projects don't really have long-term impact, right? So mm. uh, right now there is my student Shodam who is mm. actually working on territoriality in particular. So we are looking at, you know, how uh, they uh, choose partners for rest together. Uh, what, what are the relationships between territory sizes, resources, and group sizes? Um, how food affects territorial dynamics? All of these questions Shodam is addressing for his PhD. Okay, so is there any preference regarding, I mean to say any male who uh, has a better background of maternal care, he, te he tends to become more territorial, is there something like that? We don't know because you know the problem is mortality is so high, uh, doing very long term follow up studies itself becomes a very, very uh, critical problem because you know, 
we are constrained by time an ms project uh, student has 7 or 8 months to collect data a phd student has to finish in a stipulated time and in that the uh, docs keep dying so that becomes for example shorab had started working on uh, uh, some 10 groups near riser and then the lockdown happened and everything got disrupted so now that long term data is lost so this is becoming a rather uh, problematic situation that you know to follow for, to address any of these questions we really need at least 3 years 4 years data on the same uh, groups of dogs and uh, they, uh, they they get chased away they get killed so the data size is we are not attaining uh, to that optimum level that is the problem so right now we don't really have any of these long term answers okay so anyone else who wants to have ma'am i am i want to uh, hello, introduce yourself or no introduce yourself ma'am i am orun upar karmakar and i would like to ask some questions i am from first sem bsc zoology okay hello yes go ahead okay Ma'am, uh, earlier you said about a grandmother who showed alloparenting uh, characteristic. Uh, why does a dog uh, shows uh, that kind of characteristic? Why a grandmother would uh, take uh, some other pup uh, to uh, parent uh, to uh, give care? Yeah, that is a very uh, intriguing question. We cannot talk to them, so we don't know. but the point is what uh, my hunch is see uh, from what we are seeing they are like communal uh, breeders so multiple females can give birth at the same time within the group unlike in wolves or uh, coyotes which are the related species of dogs where only one female gives birth and uh, other males and females are involved in caring for these puppies okay so that is the evolutionary history that they have a history of for showing care but there there is a reproductive hierarchy only the alpha pair gets to breed here it is loosened up everybody gets to breed but i guess there is some evolutionary backlog which or evolutionary hangover which is also making them care for puppies which are hanging around okay ma'am and uh, in your article i have hello ma'am Am I yes. audible? Yes, in your yes. article, uh, there you have mentioned two hypotheses: the benefit of philopatry and assumed fitness returns. Uh, could you briefly explain those two? Yeah. So philopatry is this idea that uh, a female remains where she was born and she also gives birth at the same place. Okay. so uh, philopatry is considered to be advantageous because it's a known area there's a, there are resources and it they don't migrate out and assured fitness returns is a very interesting it's, it's like taking a life insurance policy that i give a, a bit of care to my offspring but then even if i die there are others who will care for it and make my offspring survive so that my care does not go to zero i do not do not lose the offspring so assured fitness return uh, is an idea proposed by professor gadakkar and uh, his idea was for social insects this was proposed that if there are multiple females helping each other then even if one mother dies her offspring will not die so even if the mother dies she will still have some benefit through uh, her offspring who will be cared for by others like kin selection okay so now we are saying that here also if there is allo mothering happening uh, allo fathering happening then there would be some return which is assured to the group and since these are all relatives they will each by kin selection theory they will benef benefit by helping each other out in a mutualistic scenario does that answer your question yes ma'am uh, yes ma'am and uh, this uh, assume assume Uh, fitness uh, returns theory a hypothesis that clearly justifies the behavior of the grandmother hmm okay ma'am thank you so much this was an illuminating lecture
Uh, anyone else? I think so. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Ma I have a question. Oh, Anuka has a question. Okay, fine. Uh, ma'am, Bocha, uh, earlier you said about uh, the uh, concept of selfish mother. Ma'am, is there any gender biasness for it? problem at uh, Onindita Sen. Onindita, I cannot hear you. You can't hear me? Uh, right now I can okay. hear you. Before this, yeah. Okay, I replied no to Anuka's question. Did you hear that? Yeah, now we uh, we got it loud. Onika, Onuka, you got your answer? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Onindita, thank you so much. I think so. Your lecture was very, very simple and very elusive, elaborate, even though much of the first sem might have not got into the nitty gritties of the graph, but for the PG third sem, they have this paper of behavioral biology. And so they are aware of this terminologies, which you said about the proximate, you started with the proximate and the ultimate cause. And then you uh, went down to tell a story about the dog's social behavior. So they might have got the crux of what you actually wanted to say. But overall, it was a, it was an excellently illuminating lecture, and I feel very proud to have you today at the, this virtual platform. So thank you again. My I'll pleasure. get in touch. With... Anyone who has further questions, just write to me. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So that is what Madam has directly said. That anybody who is interested in uh, having a particular question can directly like write to Madam. Okay. So before ending. Uh, first of all, I thank Onindita once more. And before ending, I have given just an attendance link, a chat uh, at the in the chat box. So all the students, please fill up. Uh, that it, it has got into the chat link. So kindly fill up that link. And Onindita, thank, thank you again. Thank you so much. Again. Uh, I think so. It has gone. It's, it has gone. So thank you, Anindita, once more.